Are you glad you're here today? I'll tell you what. And even seeing Brother Art there at the end. And Brother Bob, we both, those are the last two pictures. We lost both of those uh, men this year. Mighty, wonderful elders that's in the next realm. Aren't we glad? We may have lost them here, but they're, they're right here, I believe, in spirit. So we just welcome you as we go ahead and let those that are working with our children's church. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And, and what a precious, precious body. What a privilege it is to be a part of this family. Uh, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's a family. And whether you're here, you can't be here, you're part of a family. You're, you're part of the bigger family, God's family. But also, it's so important that we have these kind of relationships. There's, it's so valuable. In, in life, life is relationships. I say it all the time. It's really what it is. Everything else is just stuff. Everything else is just stuff. And I, I've just, the Lord's been just speaking me to focus on those that will. He keeps telling me, I've I'm, I'm got to preach to those that are, that are those that are hungry and, and strengthen the strength. And as I strengthen through the Holy Spirit, the strength in this church and those that are mature, that they will go and help those that are struggling. Amen? Because it's never supposed to be about the pastor. It's supposed to be my job is to help you. Our jobs as part of the, the ministry gifts is to get you into your ministry. And that's something the church uh, it, it's lost in general. It really came out of the dark ages thinking it was supposed to be clergy that we hired somebody to go do all that. And uh, everything was about that person, those people that were hired to do something. Uh, we're getting out of that. This is Our job is just to get you into the work of the ministry. It's yours. In fact, I think I even have that scripture on here amongst all these scriptures I have. Um, but he talks about that is, that is the whole that's the whole picture of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, um, pastor is to bring you into the, the, to perfect the saints or to mature you for the work of your ministry. He says, so that we become, the we becomes a perfect man. The we becomes a, the perfect is the complete. It's Jesus. The we becomes Jesus, each individual in particular. And that only happens when you have unity. So I'm going to tell you what, the struggle is in, in the enemy, if there's a, an adversary is to try to divide us from each other, right? The key is, is to stop the body from functioning and doing what you're supposed to do. But I'm going to tell you, that's, that's, that, that's, that's already been lost at Calvary. We just have to be willing to walk in this and to be able to let the Holy Spirit bring us to the places, the people. It, it, did the Holy Spirit bring you to Christian gathering? Amen. If you did, you need to rely on that. You're not here because of me and Gary. It, hopefully, you're here because the Holy Spirit has said, this is the sheepfold I need you to be in right now. doesn't mean you're going to always be here. I, I, I've had to, I've to change through churches, but at some point, they have a time and place. It's not all about trying to get everybody into one building. Y'all know that? I said from the beginning, y'all been here with the beginning. I said, it's never been my goal to try to build another building, right? I, my goal has been, and my, what I saw, what I really would love to see, is to empower the gifts in that church that you can go out and start other. You, you more pastors, more evangelists, more uh, teachers, go multiply this and go out and do what you're supposed to do. This is just the sheepfold. We come in here and we learn and we, we fellowship, but the whole reason we're here today is to go out there and be Jesus. It's the world. It's the purpose. And so I've been talking, and oh my goodness, uh, I, I thought I was, I thought I was going to wrap up last week on this whole three dimensions, and I intentionally did not bring other notes because I'm going to want to go back and recap. And if you've missed the last two weeks' messages, I really encourage you to do it because it's where we're going. It's a flow that we're in, and it's this three-dimension lesson that I'm getting and I'm teaching you. And last week, I actually taught over an hour because I thought, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to get through. Well, I didn't. I had to just go ahead and stop. And Brother James was going to teach today, but I said, you know what? I think I need to just do a little bit more on this. The next week after that, we're going to be on vacation. But I really wanted to be able to say there's more to this because, and really, it, there, we won't end today because this is where we are. This is, we're trying to get us to the place, and what I have uh, titled this today is the greatest gift, the greatest gift. And I did have the most wonderful gift of all, but I thought, well, you're going to sound like Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of year. But this is the most wonderful gift of all. 
This is the third level that they sang about. I don't, I didn't communicate with Brother Mark. I didn't complain about with the praise team. They're like, oh, this is what we're teaching. I need you to sing. But they sang the right songs today. That's just how the Holy Ghost works. To bring us into this place where we are. But there is a most wonderful gift. And y'all heard me say it's the third. And over and over through the Bible, it was the third level that is the greatest level. And even what we're talking about with us, body, soul, spirit. We're trying to get in that spirit realm. Because he's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that's the, the third level. So our spirit and his spirit, this is where we're supposed to be. We're getting us this place where the Holy Spirit, that is the most wonderful gift of all. Well, we thought Jesus was. We thought Jesus was the ultimate, that that was the most wonderful. But the truth is Jesus is Father, Son, and then Holy Ghost. The Jesus, God brought us Jesus. Jesus brought us the Holy Ghost. I'd read you all those scriptures. He said, I got to go away. If I can't go away, I, I'm going to go lay my flesh up here on the throne. But I'm going to come back in the form of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost and feel all of you. And Because now it's going to be more than just one person walk around in sandals. It's going to be all of us. That was the mystery. And churches and Christianity, and even myself, who believed in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I still did not really realize we still focused all on Jesus or the middle. And even more than that, we focused on this, the Bible. How many times have you heard me say, this is not Father, Son, Bible. It's Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Son and the Word is in the same dimension. In fact, he calls them this. Let's go ahead and put 1 John Five and seven, I think I gave y'all that. I haven't read this one the last two weeks. I've read y'all a lot of scriptures. If you don't know, you need to ask the people back there in the sound booth who's trying to chase me around because I give them about this many scriptures. Because I believe whatever I have to say to you, if I can't back it up here, I just need to go on home. That's my problem. I preach too long because I study too much. There's so much word to back it up. But I want you to get this because I'm trying to get you to a place of maturity that you can go out of here and go out and do what you were created to do, which that's what the ultimate purpose. He said there's three that bear record in heaven. There's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He calls Jesus right there the Word. I told y'all this is the Word, Jesus, the Bible, and Jesus is in the second dimension. Those two things, the Word tells us about the Holy Ghost. Jesus was the conduit. He was the one that said, I'm, give, I'm sending, I will be, I'm with you, but I shall be in you. I'm going to send the Comforter. I will come to you. Those three are one, but they were, he was Father in creation. He was Jesus in redemption, and he's the Holy Ghost right now. We didn't teach you who he is now. What he is doing now is in us. That's why he's doing greater things. Now, this may sound elementary, and you may hear this, but it's more than what you know. You need to really see this. There's three. There is, there's the Father, the beginning, the Word, and then now the Holy Ghost. Now he's in us, and we are the living Word. He said, you're living epistles. You're read and known of all men. That's where we're trying to get you to. Who are you? Is your job and my job and our job of the five full ministers to get you to church every Sunday? Is it just try to get you to so I can teach you more and more about Jesus and teach you more and more about the Word? It's kind of like going to college and saying, I'm going to study to be a doctor. Well, I hope you study if you're going to be a doctor. I'm having to go in tomorrow and have a procedure. I hope they've studied on how to do that before they get there. But the truth is there's people that sit around and study doctor and study doctor and study doctor and study medicine and study medicine, but they don't go out and doctor anybody. They just become professional students. That's what people do in the church. They come and they learn about Jesus and they learn about Jesus and they learn some more scriptures and they can tell you all the scriptures and they tell you the history of scriptures. In fact, they think all that is the meat. I had somebody tell me that. Well, I need to go get some meat over here because they're going to teach me the history. They're going to teach me the history of Paul. They're going to teach you. I'm like, Really, that's in the first level. Yeah, that, that's, that's really milk. That's, that's, it, the truth is, where we're trying to get people is to this third level. We're trying to get you where you're not just professional students, where you know all this, but you don't ever do it. In fact, you think somebody's been hired to do that. Well, let me let you go. You want to get saved? Well, let me go uh, 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 to bring you to my pastor. You need to get healed? Let me go bring you to the elders of the church. 
Well, there's nothing wrong with calling the elders of the church and bringing people to your pasture, but I think how it's supposed to be, I think you're supposed to be out there bringing people to the Lord and then you bring them to the church to meet the family. That's what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be doing all that. It's not like find somebody and manipulate them to church and just hope that the praise team sings the right song. And they get saved that day. And the preacher has to preach the right thing so they can get saved. And you just over there cringing, thinking somebody's going to get a little loud. That, that, sister, that somebody's going to start, woo! And then they're going to be like, oh, what is, okay, we're going to do some woes around here, Brother Ken. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, every now and then I get a double woe. Woo, woo! And you know what? You hear it across the, the, the camera. We're online. Hey, welcome people online. You have the cameras over there. We have online family. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> We're trying to get people to this level so they're not just learning. Forever students. We just, if you just know about Jesus. Let me tell you something. I'm going to bring you to the third. That is, that is where, that's that second level where it's soul teaching soul. There's, there's nothing wrong. But what we have thought was supposed to be is you're supposed to come and the preacher's supposed to teach you something. Oh, the teacher's supposed to teach you something. Well, yeah. But what I'm supposed to be teaching you is how you are to develop your ministry. I am to teach you that there's another level. I am to teach you that you... Oh, let me just read you some scriptures. I'm going to jump over all of that. Oh, Lord. We've been conditioned that it's the teacher supposed to be teaching you rather than the Holy Ghost. Let me say this right here. It's 1 Corinthians. Let's jump on this. 1 Corinthians. In fact, I think I'm just going to read it because it's kind of a lengthy. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2. I'm going to probably jump through this chapter. I could read it all. It just, it, you know, when you get in the Word, it's very hard to pick out certain scriptures or not tell the whole picture because we don't want to just take scriptures out of context. People do that all the time. Uh, but you need to kind of know who's talking and what's going on. But this is Paul speaking to the, the church of, of Corinth. And I'll tell you what, they were some messed up saints of God. And he called them saints, but they had some issues. How many of y'all know saints have issues? When he said the perfecting, he said the work was to do what? He didn't say the, the work of the fivefold ministry is about out here going trying to get a bunch of heathens. He said, no, it's the perfecting of the saints. It's trying to get you mature. It's time to help you get to this place. But, but he was writing them some, boy, he wrote some straight letters to these folks. But um, where am I going to start at? I, I didn't even give you this part, but I'm going to just stay right there on that ninth. But on up here in the um, fourth verse, I'm just, I don't you have to go there. But he said, my speech and my, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I didn't just come with you because I knew a bunch about the Bible. Back then, the Bible that they had was the Old Testament, the Scriptures. And, it wouldn't, and he knew. He was raised in the law. He knew it. He said, but I didn't come to you with enticing men's wisdom of what I have learned about Scripture. He said, I came to you in the demonstration of spirit and power. This is how the New Testament church became who it was. It wasn't because I'm going to come in here and give you a bunch of Old Testament stuff. And y'all know how much I love the Word. I'm giving you a lot of scriptures. To base it. But the truth is, he said, I'm not here to kind of just tell you everything I know. I'm not trying to bring you all these scriptures. He said, I came in demonstration of spirit and power. Is that us? Are we just relying upon what I know and what the preacher can say? No, he came to them in demonstration. He said that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man, but your faith would stand in the power of God. I guess I should have been. That is what I'm trying to get you past me. This is you in the power of God. You, little old me, whoever you are today. That's what my job is to get you to understand how this relationship that's yours that no matter what happens, because y'all know when you lay on that bed at night, it's me, myself, and I. It's when you're facing the storm, it's me, myself, and I. When all of a sudden you go, like Brother Stephen just goes to the ER, doesn't know that what's wrong, the stomach ache goes, and before he leaves, they've just diagnosed him, and basically they told, that day said, go get your, your life in order. He just went to Gainesville ER, they told him that. That's pretty, you better have something right here, and he does. What do you do with somebody else I've talked to this week? Sit on my couch and they, I messed it up. I messed her up. She's left me. It's my fault. It's my fault. She's never coming back. By the grace of God, I mean, she will, but right now she ain't. 
I knew not to go back to that dope. I knew it. Now I've got her on it. Now she hates me. Oh, my gosh. At some point, it's me, myself, and I when I had to make a decision. You ain't can't run to the pastor. It's not going to go back here and go, okay, okay. No, you need to have it here. That's what he was bringing us to. Not just to know about him, but Paul said, I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. That word know is the same word that Adam knew Eve. It's intimate relationship. I want to know him for me. If I have to manipulate you and do things to try to get you to church, and that, that, yeah, that's about me, and, and, and that's okay when you're little and young and you got to have teachers and all that kind of stuff, but there's some point that it's not about anybody, but it's you. You know this is your church. You know this is your family. You know what you get when they start singing. You know what you get in there. And you know you need them. And but that only you can decide those things. That's what we've done as pastors. We've wore ourselves out trying to get people saved and people keep them in the church. That was never the intention. The outer saving Jesus saved the world. The second one is the provision of God, the church. But we never got them past the veil where it's me and you alone. And I don't have any, I didn't finish teaching this, what the scripture says here. I want to go, let me just do it. I'll go back to this other. He said, he goes, we speak. The wisdom of God in a mystery, verse 7. Is that what we have? No. And you go on down here to 9. He says, um, because it's not written, or eyes not seen or heard, ears not heard, neither is it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him that love him. This is you. What he's prepared for you. I, I can't tell you this. I can't see it. You can't. I can't tell you. But verse 10, but the God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit sp searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. He will teach you these things. For man don't know the things. The man knows the things of, or what man knows the things of God, save the spirit of man is in him. So even the things of God know no man, but the spirit of God. But we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, which we might know the things that are freely given to us. I'm going to go back to that right there. We need to know what's been given to me. Pastor Pam can't tell you that. He said, only the spirit knows the spirit. I read through that quite quickly. But only that, uh, that's all. If he knows what he has done for you. But he said, he, by him, all things are freely given to us of God. That we might know. That's what I want you to look at. That we might know. Our third down there. But we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's why you got the spirit. It wasn't for like just getting the spirit. No, you get it because he wants to tell you what's given to you. He wants to know what's yours. That when all of a sudden you're in a place where things just went crazy, whether it was, whether it was a mistake you made with regret, fell off the wagon, or all of a sudden it's nothing you had anything to do, and all of a sudden you have something going on in your body, or all of a sudden you're just at that place and you want more. Whatever it is, it's all dimensions of this, but whatever it is, it goes on between you and when you lay on the bed at night trying to figure things out. I, I was talking to a young man yesterday who's he's been so tore up because he, it's Father's Day and he don't have his children and he wanted his children. He tried to go to court to get his children. He fought to get his children. He paid child support. And still, the courts, he, he, they moved off and he don't get to see his kids. And he's living with all this. But I'm like, you have to get this for you. I can't solve these things. The picture, These problems are too big for anybody. But it's not too big for the Holy Spirit. These we speak, not in the words of man's wisdom, but the Holy Ghost teaches. Who? No, the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things to spiritual, but the natural man don't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're just foolishness. How can he know them? They're spiritually discerned. I can talk to you all day long. I, I talked to another person, and I'm like, it was like a closed hand cannot receive. You ever anybody you're trying to, they're blind, what they can't see, and you, you know you're trying to help them? Everybody sees it but them. You can't help. You cannot open their eyes. We wear ourselves out. The church of ministers, I'm telling y'all, y'all, do y'all know, you, don't, you could not believe the number of pastors that are walking away from the pastor right now. Right here in our, our five, five churches, our five fellowship of churches in front of you, three of those churches 
their pastors left this year. One of them's on the verge. Right here. Why? I think it's a new day. I think he's bringing us to the place to get out of ourselves that this is all about the pastors. That this, we're wearing people out trying to get them to be our Holy Ghost. And we wore ourselves out trying to be your Holy Ghost. We thought we were supposed to be the people tell you what was right and wrong. Oh, let me go ask the pastor if I can go there. I can do that. Well, that's okay when you're a little bitty, but at some point, hopefully you get to the point where you're not needing to just ask that. That's the problem with religion. That's definitely the problem with the churches that are very legalistic. They never let their people mature because they all depend on what the pastor says. At some point, you got to get past that. At some point, you let the Holy Ghost teach you. You grow up. And you don't need, Paul said, you ought to be teaching. He said, but you have need, I go teach you again. I got to go put a bottle in your mouth when you should be eating meat. I don't hope nobody get offended, but I think I got a house full of powerful, mature people. I'm just, you hope you can handle this. And it's okay to need bottles. There's nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to need that. But there comes a time I should be fixing bottles. I should be helping somebody else. It's not just about come and feed me, heal me, thrill me, feel me. No, at some point I am realize who I am and I have the Holy Ghost in me. And he is the one that's going to give me the discernment. He's the one that's going to give me the wisdom that I need. It's hard right now. I look at our men and the structure and the power. Oh, my gosh. The weight that's on our, our parents, our, our men. There's a weight. I had somebody yesterday tell me, a man, he goes, I said, you have, you have this burden on you because you were called of God to lead that family. You were called to be those children's daddy. You were called to be that in that house. And there's a weight on you and things happen in life that's out of your control. You feel powerless. But let me tell you something. I don't know if you lost her uh, or if you lost them or this happened or you don't know who they are. Let me tell you something. Brother James already said it. We have a higher father. We are not powerless. We are without excuse. We cannot help what got us here, and we had no choice over that. We were victims many times of the past people who should have helped us. But I ain't no victim anymore. I am not a victim anymore. I now have the power of the Holy Ghost in me. I have a father beyond fathers who can work out situations that I can never work out. The most beautiful testimonies we'd have on Monday night when we saw families come together. People who their kids hadn't talked to them or they hadn't talked to them. And y'all know there was a healing, a reconciliation that starts happening. God wants to reconcile because he's a God of family. He knows you need each other. He knows you've been hurt in churches and he wants to heal that too. People ain't going to church out there because they were hurt in the family. I went through church hurt. I probably caused church hurt. But can we just get over that and let's go forward and let's go from this day forward? And forgive that? Forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing, really. I know when I've hurt people, you could really say, Father, they, she didn't know what she was doing because it's not my intention to hurt people. It wasn't their intention, probably. I had a young woman who had a terrible upbringing. She hated her mother. I couldn't have a conversation with her. It, the bitterness just was there. It was destroying everything. And one day she drove up in her mom's driveway and the Lord Holy Spirit spoke to her. And she, he, she heard as clear as day. He said, your mother did the, the best she could. It freed her. She brought it up to me again. That, she probably, that probably happened to her 12, 15 years ago. He brought it back and she said, I know now I'm doing the best I can. Trying to raise her own four kids. One of them, you know, you got four. Oh, one of them going to be hating you at some point. You just hope you don't get them all four at the same time hating you. But she said, I hope they know that I've did the best I could. Oh, it's easy to look back when it's on you. That's what maturity does. Some of you need to mature. So you can look back and say, hey, there for the grace of God go I. Look what I did. I didn't know better. But his reckless love just chases me down, continues working on us, that Holy Spirit, because that's what the whole ball of wax was about. He said, this is the mystery. I read it to you, scripture, scripture. This is the mystery from the foundation of the earth would be Christ in you. The mystery was not that the Jesus was going to come and redeem people from sin. That was not it. He did that. 
He came to fulfill the law and prophets, number one. Number two, to, to, to do, do away with the law of sin and death. Thank you, Jesus, for that. He abolished death. He abolished sin. We don't have to. But he did all of that to bring us to the third dimension, which would be the infilling of Christ, the anointing in us. Because he had purpose on this earth. He wants us to know. It goes on. I didn't put it there, but spiritually discerning. He says, but we have the mind of Christ. He goes on down. He goes, we have the mind. How do we have the mind of Christ? We have it. We're just not utilizing it. We're not utilizing the mind of Christ because we're wrapped up in our own mind. We're still operating in the soul realm most of the time. All of us do. We are body, soul, spirit. I have a brain. He didn't take that away from me. I still have logic. I have reason. But the same thing, what he wants me to do is to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and I take my kingdom and I cast it at your feet. I take my crown and I cast it down. Because I could go do this. I can preach some good messages. But guys, I'm just tired of preaching good messages. And can't you remember what, what was spoken the time you get to the restaurant? I hope the Holy Ghost is teaching you something to me through me today that's going to bring you higher and you're going to hear more than what you hear from me. Because it's only spirit that truly can teach spirit. Soul can teach soul. But that's why he said, hear what the spirit is said. John 16, when Jesus was sitting around the Last Supper talking to his, his 12 he said, how be it he, even the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth. He said, he'll show you things to come. This Holy Spirit, because he'd already said there, I will come to you, I will send him. This is the three or one. But that was the whole reason is to get us there. But what we do, we get stuck in the middle realm. It's like the children of Israel. Okay, y'all hear me use, I wish I had a board up here, because really it's, it does help when you can see the visual. When you talk about the threes. But two things I speak about a lot that shows you these things, and I've taught about them so much in the past. But just first of all, there's that tabernacle that he gave them in the wilderness that was three sections. It was the outer court, then the inner court, and the holies of holies. And the outer court, and I can't go through other, but there's three levels. And so the, then there's also three levels given us of the picture of the whole Moses thing and the children of Israel. They came out of Egypt, went into the wilderness, and then they went on to the promised land, right? Threes. Those are those threes. It's the same thing as outer court, inner court. It's the same thing, body, soul, spirit. Same thing, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All of these things you find, they all line up together. I've done that on the board before. They come in. But let's talk about the children of Israel. God sent Moses to deliver those, them from Egypt, Right? Well, that was a pretty good thing right there. If you was one of those people out there for 400, over 400 years, I think it's 420 years, they're in bondage. By this time, they're not just slaves, but they have been really beaten now. They're now having to stomp, uh, make bricks without even straw. They are, they're in a place of, of hard task massacre. And they were crying out, and the Lord had told Moses, he said, Moses, the crowds of my people come up, and I need you to go down there and set my people free. Moses is a picture of Jesus. Heard their cries. He was, a, he was a top and shut of Jesus. He goes over there, and he says, hey, we're going to get you out of here. They're like, yippee, let's go, right? It really didn't take any faith on their, their behalf. They just wanted out. The faith it took was Moses. Moses had to have the faith to say, okay, I'm going to go do this. Pharaoh could kill me. I've been running for my life. I killed an Egyptian, but I'm going to go trust you, God. I'm going to do it. And he did it, and he led them out from this realm to this realm. They get into, they get free. Hallelujah. All Moses did, Moses' faith, he said, just raise up the staff. He's like, Lord, I've got him here as a Red Sea, and here comes the enemy. What am I going to do? And they're going to all get slaughtered. He said, I'll just raise up your staff. He did. And God rolled back the water, and they walked across on dry land. They got another land, and y'all know the story. The water came in and killed all their enemies. He said, look back. You ain't going to see them anymore. They're all gone. And they got so happy about it, they started singing, and, and Miriam gets her tambourine out. We need a tambourine, John. I, they hid my tambourine. It's Old Testament. Okay. We got delivered of the tambourine. I was raised in a tambourine church. It was bad when two or three tambourines got at the same time, and they wasn't together. That's harsh, I know. They got the tambourine out, and they shout and dance. They're so happy because they got saved. Woo! We got saved from sin. We're in the sin out of the bondage of Egypt. Hallelujah! Well, praise God. That's pretty happy. But do you know the whole purpose of that was not to just go and get them to save them from Egypt? 
It wasn't just where they were coming from. They were saved to go to something. The whole picture, if you go back before Abraham, you go back, it was all about a promised land the whole time. It was a promise. I read you all the scripture about the promise. It was going for a promise. It wasn't like I'm just getting out of something and get over here now and shout because I got out of sin. The reason you got out of sin was for why? Was it just so I can miss hell and go to heaven someday? That's what Christianity taught. That's why they got stuck in the second realm. They got happy because they got out of the world. I got out of the slavery, and I'm not this anymore. I'm not that anymore. And they got over here, and all of a sudden, woo, we got manna every day. We got a, a fire by a night to lead us, and we got a cloud by day. Our shoes ain't wearing out. We're happy. We're not miserable anymore. But you know what? That wasn't the goal. That's what Christianity's done. We got people out of the world into the church, and now we're all shouting around talking about how great it is. We have manna every day. We have manna every day. We got the, he's doing, he's our God of provision. But we did, we said, wait a minute, that's not the purpose. The purpose was to go over into a promised land, a place where you would rule and reign, and you would take the territory for the kingdom. But we got happy with the provision of God because it's wonderful. He is a faithful God. He's a good God. But he didn't just save you to save you. He did not save you just because you was lost. He saved you, Brother Hamby always says this. He saved you while you were lost. The Bible says that he saved you according to his purpose and his grace. His purpose was not just to get you out of the sin. He knew you was going to get in with Adam to start with. He already knew that. He, he, the Lamb of God was already slain before the foundation of the earth. He all knew all that. But the whole reason is he sent Jesus to redeem you back to the place that now you can go back into the garden, which is the third dimension, which is the Holy Ghost. And you can rule and reign. And you can know things that nobody else knows. You can be on the job site here, that little ding, ding, ding. Somebody can be in distress and you go, hey, I know what I was when I went through my divorce. Or I know I, this person and this. You know, all of a sudden, you're being the conduit. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're overtaking territory for the kingdom. But let me tell you, I realized something. It took a little bit different thing to get them across the Red Sea, uh, across Jordan, the Red Sea, because Red Sea is what uh, separated them from Egypt to the wilderness, and they went on Moses' faith. They were running from something. They were like, let's get out of here. Anything's better than beating my meat off my back and killing people because I'm a slave. But now they're here. It's going to take something else. Now it's going to take their faith. Now it's going to take a Joshua. Moses couldn't take them to that next level. Moses did this. Jesus did this. But he said, I must go away for this to happen. Jesus was not the one going to lead us there. It was going to be the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be in you, and I'm going to do this. And this is what it took. It took a Joshua, because now it's going to take faith. Because now when they got over there, they get over next to the next river to go across in the promised land. They look over there, and what do they see? They see giants. They see walled cities. Now they see opposition. It's not behind them, it's in front of them. Now they're going to have to fa have the faith. Guys, this is where you are. They're going to have to have the faith to, faith to face their giants. What are your giants? Keeps you in this level that keeps you from stepping into your true gifting, that stops you from being baptized, allowing yourself to plead, let the veil of your flesh be torn where that Holy Spirit, it's not coming down, it's already down. It's coming up out of you that breaks from your spirit to his spirit that comes in here and fills you, and then it comes out of you as rivers of living water. And then I didn't give you all the scripture, and we need to probably find it and put it up there in case you don't know it. Paul said, I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. He said, I will sing in the spirit, and I will sing in the spirit at uh, uh, the understanding also. The first thing he said is pray in the spirit. That's where you're praying in that spirit where he says the Holy Ghost helps our infirmities. That's why I give it to you. He can pray for you because you don't know how to pray. And he's going to pray with utterings, groanings. You can't even utter them. You don't even know. I just go out there and sit on my swing and pray in tongues and don't know what I'm saying. Oh, you know. It edifies me. Then I start praying and understanding. I've already learned that I have this. And most people, the churches didn't even tell people that. 
In fact, they lied to him and said, that ain't for us today. It was a lie. We got stuck in the middle, and that's what we thought we were here. Hallelujah. I got saved, and Jesus, I got saved, and now I'm going to church. I'm a member of the church and all this. But they never told him there's another realm. You can go into a zone that he's going to pray for you, and he's going to bring things to you that you didn't even know was yours. You didn't even know you could do that. That's those circumstances, what I've learned in life, and I can't go tell the whole story, but where he said, I said, Holy Ghost, your own. I was, holy, I was in a situation, and I, I tell you, I, it was, I can't tell, I wish I had time to tell the whole story, but all I know is I was looking at several hundred people, and I didn't have any notes, and I was fixed to speak, and I was speaking at the Gainesville High School Auditorium, and all these people there, and, I, and the Lord told me that one, you ain't going to have any notes. And I'm like, what? I, I'm long-winded. I ain't got long to talk. But I'm telling you what, I stood up and I said, okay, Holy Ghost, your own. I walked up there that stage and I'm telling you what, the Spirit picked me up and I spoke to those people and I exactly ended. I had 20 minutes to speak. I spoke 20 minutes at the end of it. I had to stay in ovation. You felt the Holy Ghost in that whole room. I'm giving a speech because he did something I could not do because I was sick. I had the flu and I couldn't even hardly talk, sneezing, snotting, but I couldn't get out of it. I'm telling you, when you cannot do it, the Holy Ghost can do it for you. That's the whole goal, that you'll do exploits. You're not just going to talk with your wisdom and quote a bunch of scriptures to people. They may not even need a scripture. They might need a testimony today. That is about somebody to say, I don't care. Just like the young man at the restaurant, I just looked at him and I felt a connection. I said, you know, you are God's child. You have such a servant's heart. He looked at me. I said, you know, you're God's child. He loves you. He's like, well, well I, 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 I can't. it don't matter about all that. You are God's. He's like, Wow. I just was pray, speaking to the God in him, speaking, speaking things that I understand the spirit. I, could, I usually didn't know all that. I thought I had to go down the list. I need to tell you about Jesus. Do you know you're a sinner? Well, were you really going to start off with that subject? What have you been, scoping me out on Facebook? Really? How did that work for us? How about this one? If you died today. Well, do you know where you go? Well, that's really encouraging. You don't, don't be surprised. Tell me more about that. I think I want to be a part of that. In fact, you could probably scare every kid in your vacation Bible school and say they all got saved. I saw it happen out here in this church. Somebody come here, visitor. How many of y'all don't want to go to hell? Well, come down here and let's receive Jesus. Well, okay, what does that mean? You know, we, we really, I'm not... I'm not down in that. Well, yeah, I am. I am. That's the best. Thank you, Jason. We did the best we could at the time. If that's what it took, hallelujah. But can we get beyond that? Is it any wonder that those same kids that stood up and said, I'm, I've, I've received Jesus, that when they went off to the universities, they come back and said, how do we know that Bible's true? You really believe Jesus is the only way and all my friends are going to hell, my gay friends are going to hell just because they have same-sex attraction, or, or this person's going to hell because they're doing this and this person. They like, they're like, hmm, something wrong with that doctrine. Oh, yeah, but if you really, guys, you don't start there. You get people to this place that was always supposed to be. Christ in you, the hope or the expectation of the glory that will come out of you. It doesn't come out just because you learned something or because you just said something. It's we, I have to teach you this because the rest of it, he said that, uh, oh my gosh, this is, this is what I keep wanting to look at. I keep, he said, let's go to 1 John uh, 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received of him that abideth in you. This is, he's talking to the church here. That you've already received this. They'd already been through Pentecost. These were fi spirit-filled people that already spoke in tongues. He said, the anointing that you received of him abideth in you. You, oh, I, do I really need to say this? Y'all might say you don't need to come back and hear me anymore. You need not that any man teach you. I admitted it, it's there. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, it is truth and is no lie. Even as he's taught you, you shall abide in him. Guys, you get to the place where you, have, you don't have to sit around and just talk about 
medicine and doctrine and doctrine and medicine and how to, how to give shots and how to get diagnosed. At some point, you're out there doing it. Doesn't mean you don't need continuing education. I, my doctor, I hope to goodness he goes to these things and knows what's the latest thing. We continue, but we continue. He becomes the teacher, the Holy Ghost. You don't need to, the pastor to tell you, like we used to say, to tell you how long is long and how short is short. And that, would, that applied to two things back in my day in the 70s. What were they? Skirts and hair. Our guys could not have their hair over their ears or on their collar. Jason, you'd never made it. You'd never made it. Uh, uh, you'd never made it. Yeah. No, yeah. They need to go down and pray through again because they, they, they got the spirit of long hair on them. Or they got those women now got them skirt, short skirts. So now we had to say you need to find out what the rule of your church was. What's acceptable? If you're going to be in the choir, you had to have your hair cut a certain way, or you had to, you, there's no way you could be wearing short church, or whatever. But at some point, and even TV, to keep us that place, we just said you can't have TVs at all because you don't have enough self-control to not to watch the bad things. So we had to have somebody, it's outward control rather than inward restraint. You see, the, the uh, outside the law, and religion, it all is outside in. We teach you out here, get you cleaned up, quit doing this, quit doing that, quit doing And those are things you probably need to quit doing. Just keep on lying and stealing and see how good it works for you. Keep on committing adultery and see how long she stays with you. Keep on coveting and see how miserable you are. So these things, no, yeah, you need to stop that. But that was our focus, was telling you what not to do and what to in this realm. And so we kept you weak. We kept you dependent on the church or on the pastors. Because you, we didn't create the inward restraint of the Holy Ghost. Even if received as experience, we didn't tell you. you need to, you're supposed to be listening to him. Y'all know this. When you come and ask me for advice, I already learned something. I can tell you. You're probably not going to do it anyway. But at some point, I go, what do you think? What do you hear? What are you hearing? Well, I really hear anything. Well, maybe you need to go in and get you in a private closet. And maybe you need to steal your mind. And you need to get to a place where you can pray in the spirit. And then let's talk about the understanding. Uh, maybe you need to go do that. If not, what we usually do, well, let me tell you. You need to do this. You need to do this. Let's find a scripture to this. No, my scriptures, every bit of this teaches us to get to this place, the third dimension. And that's what we missed. It's to get you to the place that you have no need for a man to teach you. That the same anointing teaches you all things, which is truth, which is no lie. That his, you talk, that, and you'll abide in that. You'll live in that teaching. And it's exciting. It's exciting. It's out of this. We're not having to be controlled by people. Outward control. I looked at the kids in, when I worked in the prisons. We did all of our treatment was basically behavior modification. What it was is a reward and punishment system. That's what the law was. Do this and you're blessed. Do this and you're cursed. It was a law to control you with punishment and reward. We tell the boys, I could get, it was amazing. I could get them to behave and act right for a candy bar. And if I added a soft drink to it, man, they just like angels for the month. Because you go long enough, you don't have any candy, you don't have any Cokes, and you're, you know, 15 years old. That's a big deal when someone says, you can come up here, and I laid them out. I knew how to pick them. I'd have Snickers. I'd have Baby Roos. I'd have Butterfingers. I'm, I'm getting hungry. But I'd have a, and you know, if you don't go to security this week, you get one of these. Yes, ma'am. It's amazing how, how straight they got. You know why? Because it was an outward. It was a motivation. But y'all, I can do that all day long when they're locked up. But what do they do when they get out? There was no inward restraint developed. Prisons do a good job of outward control. But that's why I developed a faith-based storm because I told them, and y'all all know it, I said, something don't happen to their heart. They're just going to go out and be smarter criminals. They're going to be more broken because of all the junk they had to go in here. Trying to lock them up. All they do, you know this. You, may be like, you, go, you don't come out, you come out with some damage. 
Especially when you go in there, you're 14, 15 years old. With a bunch of people, 18, 19 year olds. That's what I dealt with every day. But at some point, I'd say, guys, if I can, you can get it in here. That you do the right thing because it's the right thing. You're not doing the right thing because, it's, it, because your parole officer is not going to know about it. That's what we did in the church. We became parole officers. We lived with fear. We, was, we had shame. About Guys, can we break through of that and say the way you're going to mature is at some point you're going to hear Father, and he will tell you how long is long for you, how short, short for you. That, that doesn't mean you don't have boundaries in the church. You don't want people up here that just got saved coming up here distracting everybody. We had that for a minute. Because they don't even think like we think. So there's, there's some boundaries, but I'm not talking about that. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost teaching you and bringing you and convicting you. He said that's one of the things it will do. It will show you. You don't need the law to tell you right and wrong. He's in here. Let me just finish with that. The new covenant was all about this. Hebrews 8 and 10 to 12. For this is the covenant that I'll make with you. Now, this is uh, Paul quoting Jeremiah. Um. Jeremiah said, like, the, just hold on. Jeremiah said that, that they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, but every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they'll already know me, he said. The least of the greatest, they'll know the, me, and I'll forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember their sin no more. This was prophesied way back then of Jeremiah. Paul comes in Hebrews and says it like this, For this is a covenant I'll make with you, the house of Israel, after those days. What days? After the crucifixion, after the new covenant. I'll put my laws where? In their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, they'll be to me a people, and they shall... Not teach every man his neighbor, but every man his brother, saying, "Know the." They don't have to tell him. He said, "Know the Lord, for they'll all know me from the least to the greatest, and for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more." This is what the whole ball of wax is coming to. Now, this is the new covenant. You're not going to have to go around and tell everybody. You're just going around being Jesus, loving people, doing the best you can, and just using the gifts He give you. He said, and they're going to know me. Y'all, this is huge. This is what I see as true evangelism. I just go out, and the people that he's given to me is people that he's bringing my spirit in, in my influence. I'm not going to reach everybody. I'm not, I don't have that word of reconciliation for everybody. I can say it, but what really works is I'm sitting in Denny's at midnight, and some young man here is sitting there serving me at midnight, and I can just, something goes, ding, pay attention to him. I don't know. I, well, I, did, I don't know. I may never see him again as long as I live. But I knew something happened. I was able to just be an encouragement. Y'all, this is what makes life an adventure. This, what I'm telling you to walk and talk with that spirit, is what makes it that you're laying there. And my daddy in the hospital. I had a lady this week, that, and I talk about her a lot because she, my daddy was in the hospital dying, and he didn't really know he was dying at the time. But um, he was telling everybody, I'd been here, this is my daughter. God healed her, raised her up when she's five years old. He started telling his testimony how God raised me up. But they said, you got to pronounce her dead. She's dead. She, I was laying in a coma for three days, and finally I was gone. And, and, and the Lord raised me up, and he'd tell them about it. He'd have tears. And, this little, and, and when he'd be in the night, he'd be praying. He was in suffering and so much pain. He'd be over there saying, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And she wrote me later. She came up there to see him. She was off a couple days. She didn't know Daddy died. She came up there. It was the night Daddy was dying. They were taking him off the respirator. And she said, where's Mr. Perry? And she was like, I said, he's up here. They're taking She said, oh, my gosh. She said, I went and bought him a, 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 she bought a little bear, a nurse. No, actually, she was an aide. She bought him a bear, and she wrote this card, Mr. Perry, you're the first person I've ever known since my daddy that I heard praying in their pain. I developed this new website called Not an Option, Not Live, and I've been talking about it on Facebook. It's trying to keep people from committing suicide. I let a list, y'all. It blew me away. I have 15 names of people I know personally have took their life. I feel like I'm a magnet for this. It's weird. Fifteen and 13 of them are men. Thirteen are men. Oh, I'm not hiding from this. But this little nurse, she wrote me on Facebook. She said, like, she liked that page. She said, thank you. She said, I've been struggling with this. She said, I never forget the hope I got that night in the hospital from your daddy, being knowing, caring for Mr. Perry. He was there 18 days. She said, but thank you for addressing this. Somebody has got to hear. Trey didn't tell you, but this was Trey's idea about the not an option, that part. Reaching out through Facebook. 
Because I just felt moved in the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, you know, our Lindsay died three years ago. We've been talking about this, but all of a sudden he's like, it's time to talk about it. It's time to put something in action. Y'all, that's only the Holy Spirit. My flesh want to do it right off the bat. We should have this. We should have. I quit shooting on myself and say, Lord, when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Guys, when you do that and you'll walk and say, Father, I trust you. I'm not alone in this. Because it's your deal. It's your baby. When it's birthed out of you, it's your baby. I learned a long time ago, if the pastor, everything birthed out of the pastor, the pastor's got to be the one trying to keep it going. But y'all know this, when it's your baby, nobody has to call and tell you, hey, you need to go do this today. Robin, when you open your own business, nobody has to tell you, hey, get out of bed and come do this. Well, they, might, they probably need that sometime, but no, it's your baby. It's you and Jason, y'all birth. So you're the one carrying it. We have to have our own ministries. And sometimes the best ministries come out of things like we lost a loved one, the suicide. Chris is one of those names. In fact, he's the second on my list under Lindsay. I can start going down the list and tell you, I didn't, could not believe how many I had. Why? Why me? You know what I think about that? Why I have been in those circumstances? And these people from all different work, walks of life, all walks of life. And I had this man tell me, he goes, it's because you are a part of all these walks of life. But I believe he prepared me, y'all to help the next person who puts a gun in their mouth or pulls out the rope or whatever. I think that's part of my purpose. I want to get you to your purpose. And I want to tell you something. Usually your greatest pain becomes your greatest power. If you've gone through multiple failed marriages, you are a great person to be able to help other people. To say, wait, you just need to wait on the Lord next time. Your picker's broke. You need to get your picker healed. If you're a person that had a death of a child, if you're somebody that's gone through a church hurt, if you're through somebody that had their son born without an esophagus, and, th- and there was just no hope, and he's sitting back there today <laughs> running our sound. <laughs> If you're a person that was addicted and, and AA helped you, you're the one that's going to get other people to AA. If you're the person that's lived through these things, you need to pay attention. Ah, oh, the devil got one on me. You better quit, de- quit looking at the devil. There's nowhere he tells you. You need to look to him. He's the one that's going to fight your battles. He's the one that's going to take every bad thing ever happened to you and turn it for your good. You'll let him. If you quit sitting around and doing church and being happy with the manna, why don't we get our, face our giants and say, what's wrong that I don't trust God enough to get over to the other side? I'll tell you who you need. You need a Joshua. And oh, my Lord, I get chill bumps every time I think about it. The Lord spoke to Sister Tanya. I don't know if it was last year or year before. And she thought he said that you're going to be Joshua. Then he corrected her or, or brought and he says, no, this church is a Joshua. It came back to me this morning, Tanya. I've got a something. I'm going to be a Joshua. Not every pastor is out there teaching this today. And it's not because we're better or different. It's just a calling. Amen. There was 12 spies. They were all men of God. They were all great. But there was two that were the one Joshua and Caleb that says, I will take you further. You can sit here and live and die and have Jesus and go into eternal life and hallelujah. But some people want more than that. Amen. Is that you? Is that why you're here? I think you are. Because there's many come and gone. And they're great people out doing wonderful ministries and running other churches today. Hallelujah. We have planted a lot in this city in this area. In my life, I have a lot of people out there that have come and finding me. It's weird. He's reminding me that nothing's lost to the kingdom. But Gideon started off with 3,000 men, but before it was over, it was only 300. Not everybody's ready to go across. Some people, that, that whole generation died in the wilderness. They, they, they weren't bad. They were God's people. But they didn't ever get the promise. There's some people who live and die in the church realm. We need it. You have to have the church. You can't get to here to there without going through that. But our job as the church 
is to get you to go be the church. Which is what? The we become a perfect man. Jesus. It's when you find your peace. It's when the finger attaches to the hand, the attaches to the arm, the touches, the elbow is the joint. He said the joining is what supplies it. You ain't going to do it by yourself. It's where you come together. That's why our Monday Night Groups has been the hub of this church. I'm thinking about maybe doing a few more of those. And if it don't always have to be me, some of y'all need to do it. I did it for 11 years every Monday in my house. But it was my baby. I was hoping to spread some seed to some of y'all would pick this up. If not, you're going to sit around and say, feed me. And you're going to get to the point where you're bored. You know, why I go to church? There's all kind of good preachers on the line, and there is. There's better preachers than me. But they're not your preacher. This is our tribe. I said to somebody, I said, yeah, I, that's great. You can put that stuff out there, but that's not really where we are. I don't really need to get confused by a whole lot of different voices. I think we have the gifts in this church. We have prophets in this church. We have apostles. We have the gifts in this church. You are a part of that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. What I want to do in, in, in closing, um, I, hadn't even, I didn't even get the second page. That's all right. I would like for all the men in this church to stand for a minute. All the men. This is not about this father. It's men. I felt very burdened today in thinking about the men and the job that God has given you to lead and protect and provide. He, he made you men on purpose. You're not greater, but you have a different position in the home, in the family, in our nation. I, I'm very strong on, on women, and I, we all do this together in one. In the kingdom, there is no male nor female. There's no Jew nor Greek. There's no bond or free. But in this realm we live, there is. I'm going to read you that Paul prayed. This is Ephesians 1, 16 and 19. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers. And this is a scripture been coming to me every morning. I'm making mention of you. Because it brings you to my face. He said, make mention of you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. His spirit is going to fill you. It's a place where Paul came. He said he healed him. Oh, it was Paul. He said he prayed for Paul to get his eyes, and then he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Healed and filled. Healed and filled. He said, I want to pray that you get filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I just read you where he said the Holy Ghost would come and tell you things to come. Revelation. This is not all about me getting revelation. Each one of you men, you're meant to get revelation. And the women, because when we say men, it's humanity. Man's humanity. But I'm speaking to you today. As leaders in your home and leaders at the places he's put you in this position, men are not honored like they need to be honored. But he said, I, get, I pray for the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of him. What does that mean, knowledge of him? That means that you have a knowing I pray that each one of you gets a, a, your own knowing that has nothing to do with your wife or your pastor, your kids. You have your own knowing, personal relationship. And the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. I'm praying this over you right here. Can you hear Paul saying it? I can't do Paul voice. But the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, then he says why. This is why. That you may know what the hope, uh, that what is the hope of his calling. What's he calling you for? Did he just call you because you're lost? Or did he call you, for, call you for his purpose? What purpose do you have in this body? What purpose do you have when you leave here today? Well, you don't know. I don't know. But it's how he knows. The spirit. He said that you may know. This is why. So you may know the hope or the expectation of his calling. What is he expecting out of you? That the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. I mean, I need some riches. That the riches of the glory, his presence, and the, what's going to be inherited in you, you're these saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. 
You're not powerless. You may be powerless over your boss. You may be powerless over disease. You may be powerless over a relationship. You may be feel powerless. And some of you over addiction. That's the first thing I have to admit that I'm powerless over that. I need a power greater than me to help me do it. The first step of getting free for whatever it is that binds you is to acknowledge by myself I'm powerless. But with him I can do all things. Through the, are, he said, us were to us that believe. Are you a believer? Do you love him? The working of his mighty power. The third level of the kingdom, he said, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And where does the Bible say your joy lies? I mean, your strength lies. And his joy is your strength. Woo! Guys, the only way you're going to really have joy is in him. It's not enough just to know about God. It's not enough just to have church and be safe from Egypt. That is righteousness. He made me righteous. And then I have peace because, hey, he's my provider. Woo. But if you want joy, you're going to acknowledge I'm powerless by myself. I was never made to be enough. I'm only enough in him. And then with him, I'm more than enough. You're more than conquerors. You can be the best parent you ever dreamed. It may be it's never too late to do the right thing. They might not be talking to you, but let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost can go across the sea and talk to their heart. He can go and mend things that you could never mend. He can compensate those that you have victimized. Even when we hurt our own children with our mistakes, I have to believe today that through the power of the Holy Ghost today, I'm speaking over you these things. I'm making mention of you right now that you're going to understand who you, the exceeding greatness of his power. This world it, it, it does not treat men with the honor they need to be honored. But the Bible does. God does. So I want to just have the women's fan too. Let's have our team come up here. And, and I know we've gone over today, but this is what we have to do. Let's all stand for a few minutes. In fact, can the men just step up here? Y'all just come up around here. I feel like you need to get out of your seats. Get out of your comfort zone. Just walk up here, and they're going to sing a song over you. And I want you, we're going to, uh, if any of our elders want to come or want to come and pray over the men. Romans says, the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace. Joy and peace that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He said, the joy and I didn't even read that. He said, the joy of the Holy Ghost. The joy that comes in the third level of the Holy Ghost. Father, today I pray that you fill these men with the joy, the power of the Holy Ghost.